All righty. Well, thanks for that introduction, Sterling. Um, those of you that are in here in the audience, how many of you have seen the new weather station that's near the doors to the entrance to breakfast this morning? Just a few? A few, more than a few? All right, if you haven't seen it, please stop by and take a look at it because I'm gonna talk about it during this presentation. And this presentation is gonna make a proposal that I think a lot of you will be very interested in. So here we are. We, you've known about this for years. I've been studying this for years. I did a news tr uh, travel survey this summer, as Sterling mentioned. This is one of the worst ones. This one here uh, in uh, Sandpoint, Washington. Just unbelievable. This is at the airport. Uh, radiators, anybody? Gosh. Anyway, so we published a new book about it, and we collated all of the different uh, stations did some data, simple data analysis. And the bottom line is, is now the number from, when I did it in 2007, it was 89%. Now it's up to 96% of the stations we surveyed have issues like this. Not as bad, but many of them have, have just as bad or similar type problems. Now, of course, there's all these stations all over the United States. There's the Cooperative Observer Network. The Cooperative Observer Network is run by NOAA. Uh, and administered by the National Weather Service. And it's been in place since around 1890 or so when the Weather Bureau was formed. And originally it was there for agriculture. Agriculture was the main original focus for the National uh, or the Weather Bureau back then. But it got co-opted. They started using these stations for a purpose for which they were not intended. And that's why they're so bad. They're not really climate stations. Now, each station has one of these or both of these types of instrument shelters. The Stevenson screen, which is highly problematic for um, maintenance issues because you have to keep it painted, you have to maintain the wood and so forth. And then there's the other device called the MMTS, which stands for Max Min Temperature System. But I've heard from weather service personnel, and I kid you not, they call it the Mickey Mouse Temperature System because that's what they think about it. There was one of those, uh, it went to the lowest bidder when it was designed. But both of these things have problems. They have problems with albedo, they get dirty, you know, they uh, heat up, uh, they're too close to buildings, particularly the MMTS because it needs a cable. So what we found is that in 96% of every, of all these stations around the United States, the ones we sampled, they violate NOAA's own published 100 foot rule. You'd think they'd be able to to you know, keep the stations away from the encroachment, but the problem is they don't really have control over the land. NOAA, National Weather Service, doesn't have control over what happens at these places. And a lot of these are in people's backyards as volunteer observers or at farms or whatever. And if that person decides to, they want to put in a new patio or a bunch of pavers or whatever, they'll just do it because they don't owe anything to the National Weather Service to be able to say, hey, can I put in a patio next to your thermometer? They just do it, and that's why this stuff happens. Of course, back in 2007, when I first started, you know, this is one of the most famous pictures. This is a, the fire station in Marysville, California. And all of this used to be grass years and years ago, but they turned it into a parking lot, and then they added cell phone towers. The city said, hey, we can make some money. Well, those, those uh, cell phone tower equipment sheds you see there on the right have air conditioners on it. And I can remember vividly standing there next to the MMTS with hot air blowing on me from these air conditioners. And I said to myself, this is where they're measuring climate? Fortunately, a few months after I exposed this, NWS quietly closed this station. Same thing with Arizona, Tucson, Arizona. At the University of Arizona in Tucson, at the meteorology department, those doors you see at the top, that's the meteorology department, and they put their their Stevenson screen in the parking lot. You'd think atmospheric scientists would know better. Well, the story is, is that it used to be sited over grass a long time ago, just like all of these things. But the problem is the university kept building things, and they kept having to move the station. And then they finally decided, you know what, we've got nowhere else to put it, so we'll put it in the parking lot out front. Well, that station was closed a few months after I exposed it. So in 2023, or 2022, I started looking for more of them. Here's one in Wheatland, uh, California. Uh, not, anyway, this particular station, right next to the rooftop there, you can see the infrared. And is this a good place to site a station next to a parking lot and a roof? No, probably not. 
but it's been there a couple of decades. Here's one in Idaho. This one really floored me because Arco is a very rural community. I mean, literally, it is in the middle of nowhere. But they decided, hey, let's put it next to this brick building in this car. Works for me. This one here is the most egregious one I've ever seen because it was done by design. The MMTS that you see there circled in the left is above this rock wall. And this was just created a couple of years ago. They used to have the thing over grass, but they put it there. And of course, the, the rock wall is observing, uh, observing all of that infrared or solar radiation, all that, uh, and converting it to long wave. And then at night, it radiates it out, and it heats up the sensor. And it rises. It's like the perfect place to buy us a station. Here's another one. This one uh, in Grants Pass, Oregon. Now, this one was malicious. And I say this because the Weather Service knew about it. The chief engineer at this station I know personally. And he had years ago complained to the National Weather Service that where we, you put this, is wrong. Can we move it, please? And they refused. I kid you not. And that's why I call it malicious sighting. And of course, here's Sandpoint, Idaho. It used to be where you see this equipment on the left, but they moved it to this parking lot over at the airport. And the reason for that is that the Agricultural Experiment Station, which had been running this for years over on the left, they closed. But they had to have a physical person to take the measurements off the MMTS system, write them down, and send them into NOAA. So they put it over at the fixed base operator at the airport because there was a live person there. Simple as that. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about science. The science of these heat sinks is pretty simple, really. In the daytime, a concrete object like that slab that you see there absorbs the solar radiation. It heats up. Anyone knows this. You know, stuff gets hot during the day. And at night, it re-radiates that as infrared. And that warms the air near the surface, which then, of course, biases the low temperature upwards. And because the low temperature is biased upwards, that changes the average temperature between the high and low also upwards. And as a result, because that's used to track climate change, that is what gets biased. And that's why we see this problem all over the United States. There's an example, a perfect example. This is in Fayetteville, North Carolina. MMTS is right over a piece of concrete. You can see that infrared radiating right off of that thing. So when we look at all of the good stations, the ones that have not been compromised, and literally there's just a handful left, we're just, just about 125 or so, versus the bad stations that are all corrupted, the ones that are you know, next to concrete and so forth. The blue line represents the good stations. And the orange and red lines represent different variations of the bad stations. Basically, the rate of global warming is halved when you look at just the good stations. Makes sense, right? So what do we do about this? I've been pondering this for years. And I finally decided we have the power to change this. NOAA's not going to go out and fix all their stations. I've already tried this. They'll fix the worst ones that are embarrassing. But they generally don't care. They say, oh, we can statistically adjust this. You know? You can. No one knew about this. Back in 1998, they said, we need a better network. And then they had a paper about it. And then they commissioned a design for a new station. And the US Climate Reference Network was born. It went into operation in 2005. And it's been producing data ever since. However, they say, of course, you know, we can adjust for these problems associated with the bad stations. But they can't. And all these adjustments do, homogenization, is when you get 96% of them corrupted, is smear the bad data around and cover up the good data. You bias the good data warmer. That's the problem. And they don't talk about the Climate Reference Network, the new state of the art network, in any of their public reports. And meanwhile, it hides in the background. The public is virtually unaware of the good data and what it says. Here is a comparison of US CRN data on the left, the good data produced by this new network, versus NASA GIS over on the right. And I'm sorry these aren't to scale. But you can see that NASA GIS is reporting a, 
significant upward trend, whereas the same period over on the left, it's flat, virtually. There may be a slight trend, but nothing like what GIS is doing, and GIS is using all of the bad data. So the idea here, circumvent them by creating an independent network, and that's what that weather station is about. Play stations to get clean, independent data, open architecture and open access. No need for the government anymore. The government controls all of the climate data. We need an independent set. No need for the data adjustments, trustable temperature data, monthly publications of this data, and open to the public. So, the USCRN is old technology, and the weather instrument technology has advanced dramatically. The costs are much lower today. The station I designed out there to meet and exceed USCRN, $2,000 versus $30,000. So I am introducing the Global Openness Atmospheric Temperature System. GOATS, why? Well, it's going to get Noah's GOAT, that's why. It's literally. So here is the USCRN station on the left and my station on the right. And these will have the same kind of, of features. They'll be well-sided, triple redundant temperature sensors, fan aspirated shields, and um, the, the accuracy is equivalent, a tenth of a degree centigrade. And you know, the interesting thing is that NOAA with the co-op network, they round up all the temperatures to the nearest degree Fahrenheit and then convert them. So there's precision loss and everything else going on. So it's gonna be better than NOAA, or at least it's good in many cases. Um, it's gonna be reporting data every one minute with a 10 minute average. And the reason for this is because back in the day when mercury thermometers were there, they were not responding instantaneously to high temperatures. It took them time to warm up. So a lot of the problems that we've got with the new temperature data set from electronic sensors had to do with the fact that if the temperature goes up briefly, you know, for a couple of seconds, those sensors can detect that. And so we get an artificial high compared to what was measured in the past. The solar powered, cellular data reporting and going out to the cloud. And they've got GPS. So if someone tries to steal them, we know where they're going. Plus, we know where they are sighted accurately. And this is what it looks like. And it's got two-way communications. We've got a data logger box that goes out of the cloud. You can get the data. It has the ability to add sensors. It'll start with just simply temperature sensors and maybe a carbon dioxide sensor. But we can add all of the stuff that NOAA uses for the USCRN. So it's open access, reasonable cost, plug and play. If you can set up a home stereo system, you can set up one of these. One person, all is needed. Don't need a contractor, don't need to pour concrete for a base, none of that stuff. And it is deployable worldwide. Well, placement, we'll make sure that these are placed properly. We'll look at Google Earth and so forth. We have a robust system, uh, it'll operate several days in full darkness with the solar panel and battery. We've got maintenance taken care of, and ongoing costs are small, $50 a month or less. And we've got built-in security. All of the things necessary to make this happen. This is a screen capture from a couple of minutes ago of what the data output looks like. And as you can see there, we've got the three probes We've got humidity and we've got carbon dioxide. And the three probes data is automatically averaged. This will go into a cloud database, open access. Anyone can get it for any data analysis they wish. Go prove it's wrong if you can. Thank you. We do need sponsors. I want to say, we, if any of you want to step up and help us out here, one of these stations costs $2,000, and I will be happy to put your name on it as sponsored by. Thanks for your consideration.